Hey, Glenn, Randy, and Brandon. We'll give folks some time to get on. Hey everyone, thanks for uh, being here. I'm just gonna give it a couple minutes while people still keep signing on. I'm not sure how many to expect. And um, just so you know, you can see it on your screen, I think, but uh, for now, everyone's muted. Um, and we'll, we'll pause and let um, unmute phones for questions and stuff like that. Um, so we'll just give it a few more minutes.
Well, maybe while we're waiting for more people to join, um, so far it looks like we've really, we've just got about 11 people on here. And I can see most people's uh, name, unless you're on a phone. Um, Dave, I see you are calling by phone, but I recognize your number. Um, but let's see, and maybe Leah, you can help me, um, or maybe I can do this myself. Um, let's see who is calling with the last um, three digits of the phone number 939. I'll unmute you. Thanks, Heather. Dave. Hey, Dave. I got you. You're, you're 172, right? Yeah, 7172. Thank you. Got you. And what about... Go back uh, on mute. Okay. And what about the caller with the um, last three digits of their phone number of 939? It's a 360 number. Caller, you can, oh, there you go. You unmuted yourself. So who's calling in on the phone number with the last three digits, 939? You're unmuted. Okay, well, um, I don't know. So we can't hear you talking if you're trying to talk. You might want to try logging out and logging back in. Um, it might be a problem on your speaker's end. Thanks, Leah. Um, so while we're trying to figure that one out, um, there's another call in on a 425 number with the last three digits, 590. Star six to unmute yourself. There you go. Hi, Your Heather, this is Michael Sowen. Oh, great. Hi, Michael. Yeah, well, great, everybody. Um, we'll kind of get going here. I probably should have talked you through um, some of the Zoom webinar for folks that haven't used it, although it sounds like uh, most people are getting pretty familiar with this after our year or more of virtual meetings. But in general, we'll just keep the um, everybody muted during the presentation, but I'll pause periodically um, as we go through everything and uh, give everybody time to um, ask questions or uh, provide comment. So it we won't have to keep it too rigid. There's just 12 of us on the call right now. Well, 14, including me and uh, Leah Snyder who works in our FISH program. Uh, so you can unmute yourself by pressing star six if you're using your phone and you can raise your hand um, by using star nine if you're on your phone. And then we just would ask if you uh, don't use the chat for questions. But again, I'll, I'll uh, try to make sure I've, um, I pause enough uh, so folks can ask questions and, and provide input during the meeting. So let's see, we've got uh, 939, uh, calling in again. So let's see if we can um, hear you this time. If you're and you can press star six to unmute yourself on your phone. Looks like you're unmuted, but I, we still can't hear you.
<clears throat> well, I heard that. <laughs> so we're getting closer. Well, maybe by the end of the meeting, we'll figure out who that is. But anyway, for now, let's just, um, let's get the meeting started. Uh, thanks everybody for uh, taking time out of your evening to attend the, the halibut meeting. Um, I'm gonna start by walking you through the agenda. Let me just pull that up here. Can you see the agenda, Leah? Yes, I can, Heather. Okay, perfect. So um, just start out with the purpose of the meeting. Um, we just kind of roughly went through introductions. Um, I can let folks who, who know who's on the, on, the, on the meeting, but I think everybody can see who's on the meeting if you've, um, logged on through Zoom. If you're on by phone, uh, just for everybody, um, we've got Glenn Teeter on the line, Randy Lato, Brandon Mason, Dave Johnson, Butch Smith, Mike Henderson, Tom Burlingame, Michael Sawan, and Stevenson from the WDFW Puget Sound Sampling Program, Chris German from the Coast Guard, Wyatt German, uh, Jason Downing, and let me just check and see if anybody's signed on since I wrote those down. And then um, the caller on the 939 number. So uh, anyway, again, thanks everybody for being here. Um, the purpose of this meeting really is to uh, start the process for looking at halibut season dates and season structure for the upcoming 2022 halibut season. Um, I'll walk you through how that process works in more detail, but really this, this is just the start of the process and we'll get it rolling by going through um, the 2020 season, at least where we are through, um, through the end of June mostly and what we've got in terms of the season in August and September. And then uh, we'll move on to um, talking about the 2022 uh, season and the planning process on how that works. I'll just scroll down here. Um, at the end of the meeting, we can refresh ourselves. I'll talk about this um, at the introduction, but also just review the next steps, which is how the season setting process um, goes and, and the other opportunities to provide input um, through our public meeting and then also through the Pacific Fishery Management Council and IPHC. So um, and maybe I'll pause here and just see if anybody has any questions about the agenda or, or um, what we want to accomplish tonight um, before I move on. Okay. Hi, Mike. I see your hand raised. It looks like you're unmuted, Mike, go ahead. Hi, Mike, if you're talking, we can't hear you. So you're muted now. Um, Okay, I'm like, I see your chat that says, sorry, maybe you didn't mean to um, have your hands raised. There will be another meeting. Let me, um, 
there'll be another meeting in October. So the way the process works, and maybe I'll just get started. Um, and yeah, if, if you're trying to talk and I can't hear you, feel free to use the chat, we'll work through this. Um, but yeah, let me walk through the process, Mike, and so you can understand how and when there'll be other meetings. Okay. Are there in the chat, Mike asked, will there be another meeting? Yeah. Thanks, Leah. I think I'll, I'll go through my little presentation so people understand how this process works and when we'll have the other meeting. But just for now, um, Mike, the next meeting will be in October. And uh, so there'll be an opportunity for more public comment through the Fish and Wildlife um, meeting, but you can also provide comment at the September and November Pacific Fishery Management Council meetings. So there's, there's quite a bit of opportunity for comment, but the best place um, to get the Washington input is at this meeting and at the meeting we'll have in, in mid-October. So let's see, I'm gonna stop sharing the agenda and bring up my presentation here. Okay, do you see my presentation or do you still see the agenda? Presentation looks good. Okay, great. <laughs> so yeah, I wasn't sure what to expect and um, I wasn't sure how many people are familiar with the process of setting halibut season. So I just wanted to take a few minutes to give you an overview on halibut management and, and how it's related to the Pacific Fishery Management Council and the International Pacific Halibut Commission. So um, the International Pacific Halibut Commission is really the um, agency responsible for the biology research and conservation of Pacific halibut. Uh, they do an annual set line survey, which provides information on the status of the Pacific halibut stock all the way from um, the Bering Sea, Aleutian Islands down to uh, Northern California. And at their annual meeting every year, they set annual catch quotas and they set the allocation for that entire region. Um, the Pacific Fishery Management Council has the allocation authority for our area, and I'll show you here in a graphic next um, on the next slide, uh, which is often referred to as Area 2A. So you'll you'll hear that a lot. Um, and then uh, also, this is where we facilitate uh, management coordination for the entire West Coast. So here at this meeting, you know, we're focused on Washington. But Oregon and California are having similar meetings right now during this time period to funnel that um, information to the Pacific Council. And then the National Marine Fisheries Service is the agency that has the rulemaking authority. Um, and uh, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, you know, we really act a, in an advisory role in, in the management of halibut. We're responsible for catch accounting and um, tracking our catch relative to our quotas and our sub area quotas. We hold meetings like this to facilitate stakeholder input. And we also have an enforcement responsibility. And uh, it's through the Pacific Fishery Management Council uh, where we funnel that information into the area 2A catch sharing plan. Um, and Here's the graphic I wanted to share to show you the entire IPHC regulatory area. So out here in the Bering Sea, the Aleutian Islands, all the way through the Gulf of Alaska, and then including British Columbia, that's the international uh, component of, of the US and Canada coordinating our management. And then to area 2A here, is uh, the southern end of the Pacific halibut range. It's Washington, Oregon, and, and California. Um, when we talk about the halibut catch sharing plan, um, it describes the allocation. And so for example, the 2021 area 2A total allowable catch is about 1.5 million pounds. 
And then that's broken down into um, the tribal total, which is about 35% of that, 528,500 pounds, and the non-tribal total of 981,500 pounds. The non-tribal uh, catch is further broken down to a commercial allocation, which represents about 20% of the 2A TAC. The Washington sport allocation represents about 23% of the 2A TAC, and it's further broken down into our sub-regions for the Puget Sound, the North Coast, which is Marine Areas 3 and 4, the South Coast, which is Marine Area 2, and the Columbia River area, Marine Area 1, which we also co-manage with Oregon. Then Oregon has separate um, allocations for their Central Coast sub-area and their Southern um, sub-area, which is south of Humbug Mountain. And California, um, their allocation for all of California is about 39,260 pounds and represents about 3% of that area to a tax. In terms of the halibut management and the timeline, this is where I want to um, walk through this graphic that I put together a couple of years ago to help uh, people really understand um, the different agency and the timelines of decision making and why we start now in August and where we're headed um, to having final approval of our regulations. So, August is a time frame where we hold our first public meeting. We're looking at proposed changes to the cat sharing plan, not really for allocations, but more for season structure, like what dates or range of dates that the season would be open or the days of the week that the season are open. If we're considering an allocation change, it's a much uh, lengthier process and we would have more council meetings and more public input for that. Um, and the idea behind this August, September meeting is it gets the Washington stakeholder input um, and I will write up the information from this meeting and submit that as a report to the Pacific Fishery Management Council for the meeting that will be held September uh, 8th through the 15th. And we'll touch back on that too, so you know when to tune in and, and if you wanna engage in that process as well. In mid-September, this is where the council takes that input provided by not just WDFW, but also Oregon and California, and they'll approve a range of alternatives um, to be considered for changes to the cat sharing plan for next season. So it can be a broad range of ideas um, if needed, but the idea is it goes out for public comment, and then we'll, we will meet again at that October 18th meeting date and um, further refine those alternatives. And as a group, you know, this is the meeting where we'll bring tide tables and calendars and actually uh, recommend season dates for 2022. Um, so we do that in, in October um, and then if there's any analysis that needs to be done with that, we'll bring that back and it provides the, the basis for a report that we'll write and submit to the council for the November council meeting, where the council will then adopt those changes to the area 2A catch sharing plan. Um, and then what this does by, by having those specific dates and we made the change, it's maybe been five years or so ago um, to have the actual dates adopted by the council in November, then uh, I can post those on our agency website, you know, by the end of November as preliminary dates. And I, you know, we call them preliminary dates because there's still some rulemaking to be done. The IPHC has the opportunity to review them and, and provide comment on them. Um, but usually those dates are, are pretty settled and resolved by mid-November and, and we haven't really had any feedback from IPHC or NIMS to, to reject the dates that we propose. So they're available, they're on our website and folks can use them um, for planning while the, the rest of the process is ongoing. Um, 
in late November, the IPHC holds what's called their interim meeting. And it's where uh, we get our first view of the, um, the coast-wide coast um, survey, long line, um, set line survey, and the preliminary results of the stock assessment and um, harvest limits for the upcoming year. Um, the interim meeting also, there's some discussions on research proposals and any preliminary regulatory changes that are being brought forward. And then in late January, occasionally in early Feb or February is when the IPHC holds their annual meeting. And this is where they review uh, management performance for all areas. Um, we submit agency reports, which are now just an agency report for the US and an agency report for uh, Canada, um, but it includes information for all of the regions from Alaska, Washington, Oregon, and California. The IPHC adopts any regulatory changes, and this is where the Halibut Commission approves the changes to the two-way catch sharing plan as recommended by the Pacific Fishery Management Council coming out of that November council meeting. Um, and so then from there, this is where National Marine Fisheries Service takes those um, proposed and final rules to implement the changes. And once those rules are um, adopted, then Fish and Wildlife will, we adopt um, regulations that conform to those federal regulations. And that's when we re remove the word preliminary and we have our final um, season dates posted to the webpage. And we usually do a news release with those dates in them as well as we uh, um, go through the emergency rulemaking to adopt those conforming rules. So again, uh, really what we do at WDFW, we provide the opportunity to get stakeholder input on regulations and season dates. We monitor the catches. Um, we monitor them by regulatory area. We're also tracking incidental um, halibut catch in the salmon troll fishery and uh, the sable fish fishery north of Point Chehalis. Um, again, we're responsible for enforcing regula regulations. And all throughout the halibut season, we're coordinating with IPHC, National Marine Fisheries Service, staff from the Pacific Fishery Management Council. And um, in our case, we also coordinate with Oregon relative to seasons and um, dates in the Columbia River area. And I think this is probably familiar to all of you. I just realized this afternoon, this graphic doesn't include Marine Area 1. Sorry, Butch, it's cut off, but, um, oops. Did I stop sharing my screen? Or can yeah, you, you did. Me? Well, I can still see your documents, but you stopped sharing the presentation. Okay, how's that? Better. All right. Thanks. Um, so this just shows the management areas. Uh, we we've have, have our recreational fishery open in marine areas 1 through 10. Um, marine areas 11, 12, and 13 aren't open for halibut fishing. So I think here I'll, I'd like to pause and see if there's any questions about the, the process and, and what we're doing here. Hi, Glenn. Let's see. Looks like you're still muted, but there you go. Can you hear me now? Yep. Awesome. Um, the process is pretty pretty straightforward. The only thing I want to bring to your attention that Oct that October eighteenth is on a Saturday, and it's also on the opening deer season Saturday. On top of it. Is it? it? Okay. Well, I wonder if I have my date wrong because it's it's a Monday. The 18th is? Well, I, I maybe I'm wrong. I maybe intended. I'm wrong. You, you know what? I did look at it wrong. The 18th is a Monday. Sorry about that. I was looking in August. Phew. Okay. Yeah, that's, I feel better now too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, but I do remember that we have 
talked about how this October meeting overlapping with hunting. Is that not a problem? Well, it's at least it's not on a on the Friday or Saturday of the opening weekend. It's on the Monday. Okay, okay great. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right. So I think what I'll do, let me uh, stop sharing this and I will bring up let's see. Well, I am no longer seeing my little handout I had here. Let's see. Hmm. I wonder why that is. Why can't I find this, Leah? Or... Is it showing that it's open? On... No, uh, it, it, it is on my computer. On your computer? Yeah. So let me just make sure. You might need to reopen the document on your computer. Okay, let me just try that. I'll close it. Fairness. Good. <laughs> okay. Can everybody see the Washington Recreational Halibut Season <laughs> Reviews? On Looks good. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, before talking about this season, I wanted to just take a minute and talk about um, 2021 and, and the plans we had for um, the 2020 season, and maybe even backing up to 2019, um, because it really set the stage for where we are now. The way we set the season for 2020 and 2021 was really a lot in response to um, what happened in 2019. And, and uh, for folks who aren't aware, in 2019 is when the IPHC um, at their annual meeting, they uh, approved a consistent area 2A total allowable catch for a four year period. Um, and this effort was, was largely driven by Washington tribes. The Macaw tribe was uh, really critical in this, but also with a lot of support from area 2A 
managers, not just in Washington, but in Oregon and California as well. So if you think back to before 2019, we had much smaller area 2A quotas and we were, you know, at times contemplating area 2A tax of around 790,000 pounds, you know, compared to what we have um, now at the 1.5 million pounds. And it wasn't just a, uh, recreational halibut fishery managers that were struggling with these low tax and allocations and having seasons that lasted three, four, five days. Um, but the tribes were struggling as well and it made it very difficult for them to, to plan. And so if you think back on that map that showed the range of the halibut stock and where the 2A stock assessment occurs, and you'll hear this a lot, um, the, the halibut biomass, we are kind of, uh, we're at the tail end of that distribution and our, our um, total allowable catch kind of reflect that we're not where the majority of the biomass is. And so a lot of times people say, we're just a drop in the bucket. And when this idea came out about um, consistent to a tack, from year to year to year, regardless of what the stock assessment said, the question you know that that we put to the stock assessors was, will this have an impact on the overall Pacific halibut biomass? You know, we didn't want to do anything that would, would have a negative impact on the biomass, but what the stock assessors said is, no, that level of take on a consistent basis shouldn't impact the biomass as a whole. And so we've been able to structure these seasons knowing that we'll have 1.5 million pound allocation. Um, and that has provided a lot of, uh, an ability for us to craft these seasons that aren't having to change drastically from one year to the next. So we, um, we still have to advocate for that continuing um, next year, 2022, will be the fourth year of that agreement. Um, I think we'll have to continue to, to fight for it and support it. But then beyond 22, um, you know, that'll be a topic of the halibut um, annual meetings and preliminary meetings. And I'm sure uh, conversations between states and um, our tribal co-managers. So anyway, just wanted to put some context on that 1.5 million pounds and what it's given us in terms of um, some ability to have uh, this management structure in place. We didn't know uh, when we set the 2019 uh, season structure that we would have 1.5 million pounds. So looking way back to 2019, uh, we really had to do a lot to add some additional days to um, get access to more of the halibut quota than we anticipated we would have. Um, so then we regrouped and we were ready to go forward in 2020 with some opportunities that everybody was really excited um, to see implemented. And that included um, some dates that opened earlier in the Inner Puget Sound in April. And we hadn't done that since 2010 some more consecutive fishing dates. Um, so Thursday, Friday, Saturday, um, kind of back-to-back -back things that um, we would do. We'd, we'd also tried to um, align um, management areas so that there was less overlap. And to do that, we had to make some pretty um, big compromises with some traditional halibut dates in say um, green area to Westport um, that likes to fish on, on Sundays compared to the North Coast and the Bay and the Push that like to fish on Sundays. So as we were talking about the 2020 season, we had these season setting principles that we used uh, to develop that and, and, and also make sure that we weren't exceeding our quotas so that you know, we could have the structure in a way that provided as much access and opportunity as possible, but without going over the allocation. So just walking through these, um, you know, the first one was avoiding effort shifts. So 
we wanted to continue align fishing days as much as we could. And one of the things we really needed to do as more fishing effort was starting to focus on the Columbia River with um, Westport quota getting taken so fast was we aligned uh, the fishing uh, dates between the Columbia River and, and Westport, which we also call the South Coast sub area in the catch sharing plan. Same thing at uh, the North Coast, Nia Bay and La Push, and aligning that with the um, season dates in CQ so um, that we could really maximize that season length and, and fishing opportunity. Uh, this, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier. We, folks really wanted to know in advance what the season dates would be so that there could be more planning. And this really gets at what we've had to do in the past and in terms of adding season dates and that, you know, in 2019, there wasn't a whole lot we could do about it, but we know that um, people are able to, to um, use the fishing opportunity for halibut days if they know in advance. It's, it's not something you just say, hey, I think I'm gonna go halibut fishing tomorrow. <laughs> you know, people need to plan and get a hotel and all of that. So that goes back to, having some preliminary dates on our website, but also um, the idea, which you'll see down here, of, of notifying people of when there might be um, additional fishing opportunity. Um, and then uh, providing more fishing opportunity in areas where the catch has been below the sub-area allocation. And the Puget Sound is really just um, a good example of that. And it's actually, in the time that I've been working on halibut, uh, we've gone through a period, if you go back to 2008, um, really struggling to keep catch in the Puget Sound below our allocation, uh, to now um, where we're struggling to provide enough fishing opportunity to get at that Puget Sound catch. And um, some of it has to do with the higher area 2A tack and what that means for the Puget Sound um, sub area allocation, uh, but we've had to do some, some shifting there. And so that's where we got at this uh, uh, um, idea of opening the fishery in those inner Puget Sound areas in six through 10 uh, in April. And then recognizing these traditional days if, if we can. And so that's the, you know, mentioning Sundays as an important halibut fishing day for Marine Area One, Saturdays in uh, marine areas three and four. We also know that in marine area five, they have a, a very long running halibut derby. So wanting to make sure that the quota is available through Memorial Day weekend when that derby's held and, and lets folks in that area um, plan for that. Oh, hi, Mike, thanks for the question. Yeah. So Marine Area 4B goes to the CQ River. So that would all be accounted for as Marine Area 4. And then Marine Area 5 starts at the CQ River. And that Marine Area 5 is really what we refer to as the Puget Sound. So um, thanks for the question. And I know that whole, that whole issue has been complicated by the fact that um, the port of Nia Bay um, and La Push has been closed. So, um, so anyway, for setting the 2020 halibut season, um, we use those season setting principles. And I, I wanted to share that now because we know what happened in 2020 and that all fell through the cracks. We didn't get to implement a lot of that. We really had to revise and restructure how we had the halibut season in light of close it, you know, our recreational fishery closures that started in March. And, and uh, that was the first time we then um, had halibut fishing in August and September. And what does that look like? Um, so when we got to setting the 2021, this season's halibut season, and we had this same meeting last August, you know, the input from everybody was, well, we really don't 
want to make any changes. We actually just want to fish on the season structure that we had planned for 2020. So that's maybe a little bit of a long way to, to get at the point that we didn't really make many changes for 2021. We really just said, nope, we want to try what we had um, set out to do in 2020 and 2021. And I guess relative to the season dates, that's what we did. Uh, as you all know, um, we still were faced with the idea of the port of Nia Bay and the port of La Push being closed during the early um, halibut opener. And I know La Push is open now, but uh, Nia Bay remains closed. So uh, I'll just walk through these dates. Uh, these are all really the dates that we have already gone through. So basically in marine areas six through 10, this is where you see that April, April 22nd opening, um, Thursday, Friday, Saturday dates from the get-go with a nice long opener through Memorial Day weekend, Friday through Sunday. And then after Memorial Day, resume that uh, three day per week all the way through um, the end of June. Green Area 5, uh, we stuck to um, aligning that with the North Coast, so opening on May 6th. Um, Marine Area 5 opened before Memorial Day, Thursday and Saturday, which is the same as the North Coast sub area. Um, over Memorial Day weekend, they're open um, Friday through Sunday. And then uh, in the North Coast, that was only open Friday and Sunday. Um, and then after Memorial Day, Marine Area 5 resumed the three days per week, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and the North Coast went back to the two days per week of Thursday and Saturday. Marine Area 2, which is a sub area where um, we see the quota get taken really quickly. Um, it opened again, aligned with um, not just the North Coast, but also the Columbia River opening on May 6th uh, through the, just before Memorial Day weekend. And this is the two days per week, Thursday through Sunday. Um, and then open Memorial Day weekend, Thursday, May 27th. And this structure is really um, acknowledging the fact that the hope is we get through Memorial Day weekend in Marine Area 2 with enough quota. Um, and then, but with the, you know, the principles that we outlined at the beginning of identifying, hey, if there's more quota, um, these will be the dates that that will open if there's any quota remaining. You know, there's always weather that comes up. So if quota isn't taken during those initial days, it'll be June 17th, 20th, 24th, and 27th. Um, Columbia River, very similar in um, the early season and through Memorial Day weekend. But then after Memorial Day, um, if there was quota remaining in the Columbia River sub area, um, it would just go back to the Thursday, Sunday structure. Um, so again, uh, didn't really anticipate um, that the ports of Nia Bay and La Push would still be closed. It really slowed down a lot of catch in the North Coast. And um, so here's the results of the catch through June. Um, and this is, a breakdown of the sub area quotas by, um, by each area. And so this is just through the dates through June. I don't have any of the most recent um, catch data yet. So this is where we ended up uh, with 72,000 pounds of quota remaining at the end of June in the North Coast, just under 30,000 pounds of quota remaining in the Puget Sound. Um, we opened some additional days in the South Coast for all depth and going over their allocation by 16,000 pounds. Columbia River um, by going over just, over, um, excuse me, just over 700 um, pounds. And then none of the allocation for the Columbia River um, near shore area taken. And 
But what we also want to look at too here, and this is where we talk about flexibility in our Washington sport allocation and making sure that, you know, we're providing opportunity to take as much of the quota as we can. Um, at the end of June, we were at about um, 85, more than 85,000 pounds of quota remaining. So we um, met with National Marine Fishery Service, IPHC, Oregon, and said, you know, the concept of this late summer opportunity in August and September was, uh, we had a lot of positive feedback for it. Nobody wanted to reserve quota specifically for it, but if we have extra, uh, would really like to uh, open the halibut fishery back up. We avoid opening the halibut fishery in July. It's really, there's a focus on salmon season during that time. It's incredibly difficult for our sampling programs to produce really good quota management estimates for um, estimates for two quota managed fisheries that are operating simultaneously. So we take a break during that salmon season in July from halibut fishing and then come back in, in August. And so we added um, these additional days focused on the North Coast and Puget Sound sub areas uh, where the quota was still left, reopened um, just last week. So August 19th through September 25th, um, three days per week, Thursday through Saturday, um, and then also added um, another all depth day. So every area will be open on Friday, August 27th. So this Friday. Um, and I think maybe this is a good place to pause and see if there's any questions about this season or where we are. Um, I think Anne, Anne sent me a message last week that she heard reports of folks catching halibut it was, it's difficult to use last year's effort in August and September, which is really the only time we've been open to anticipate what would be caught this year with more public notice. And that was one of the things we did in working with NIMS to open these additional dates was we got the, the news out there as early as possible so people could plan. So we could really get at taking that, that 85,600 pounds of quota that we had remaining through these, um, these late summer and fall days. Okay, no questions. Um, so then as we talk about season planning for 2022, uh, like I said, I, you know, we still have to go through the IPHC process and, and setting the 2A allocation, but 2022 is part of the agreement to have that consistent 2A TAC of 1.5 million pounds. So we could be looking at a quota similar to what's in place this year. Um, and uh, so this first here, um, is really just describing what we did for 2020, 20, 2021, um, where I explained that, you know, folks really just wanted to um, take the general season approach that was approved for 2020, continue to have the flexibility to open the Puget Sound in mid-April, the flexibility to open the North Coast and South Coast on April 30th, if it aligned with that opening date in, in um, on a Thursday. So we get every area um, as much as possible open on the same date. Of course, with that exception of the areas six through 10 that opens in April. We did have to make some changes in the catch sharing plan, but they were really um, aligned with changes we made to ground fish retention. So we, um, through the ground fish management process, made some changes that allowed more ground fish retention on um, halibut days and marine area one. Um, and then we moved a, removed a couple of uh, yellow eye rockfish conservation areas in uh, marine area two. And 
those were described in the patch sharing plan. So we just had to reflect those uh, changes um, for 2021. And, and those are related to groundfish management and, and the recovery of yellow eye rockfish and changes that we've been able to make to uh, provide more access in that area that they, they've got some linkage to um, halibut fishing as well. So, um, yes, but here you go. There I am. So Heather, I would um, like to to thank you for all this information and am you know I want to jump ahead of the thing, but am supportive of the same man management regime as we had a, as this year. Um, but I'd also uh, hope and thank and thank WDF and W for getting us ground fish retention during our halibut days, but um, gonna need your help supporting Oregon um, doing the same. There may experimental um, retention south of the Mason Dixie line uh, went, you know, went great. And I think if you can help me support in the same structure or maybe adding a few, a month maybe, or, or a few more days, that would be, uh, that would be awesome sauce. Maybe we can convince Maggie to mirror exactly, you know, the two, the two, uh, uh, states in, in the same area would be, would be, uh, I think really good and and less confusing because right now if you uh, zip out on the 29th or whatever day we're leaving yeah 29th I think uh, you know you fish in our area one you fish south of the Mason Dixie line no lingcod no nothing any fish north of there then you can you can keep those things so I just um, like to thank you for your support last year and and continue to help me with Maggie and, and convince her it was a good deal. Okay, yeah, I know as much as we can align these regulations at borders, um, it's helpful. And so, um, yeah, appreciate that, Butch. Chris, I see your hand up if you wanna. There we go. I think it's working. Um, anyway, I just wanted to, uh, to echo exactly what you're saying there, you know, both from uh, from the Coast Guard and then just from the enforcement consultants, BFMC kind of thing. But uh, from enforcement, anytime we can get those regs simple enough for uh, fishermen to understand, they're more likely to comply. And it's easier for us when we're crossing borders back and forth um, to enforce those regulations. So just want to kind of jump on uh, Butch's bandwagon there and um, and just, you know, echo our support for that. That's it. Thanks, Chris. I figured you were going to say that. <laughs> uh, see, I got another hand. Okay. Go ahead, Mike. Hi. Um, so is this the point where you're asking for our feedback on this proposal, basically to kind of do the same next year as this year? Yeah, and this is where you would yeah, offer your, your input on, on if you thought 2021 worked well and you want to see a similar structure for 2022 or if you have other ideas, this is where you bring it up. Okay. Well, thank you for the presentation and the information and the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, I live in uh, uh, North Whidbey Island and I'm a member of the Puget Sound Anglers Fidalgo group and I'm a director of that group. And I've surveyed our membership uh, to see what their thoughts are regarding halibut season uh, next year. And the general consensus is we would like to see the uh, opening much earlier. Uh, the reasons for that are that uh, we analyzed the, the creel reports that show uh, the fish and game creel reports show that the highest success is earliest in the season and it drops down considerably after about the 
second week of May. Um, the graybeards who live up here tell me that the season used to be in February and March, and that's when the best fishing was up, up here. Apparently the fish come from the deep ocean and spawn in shallower waters here in late winter and early spring, and they leave. Um, and we happen to catch a few of them before they go with the current season, but we would like to see the season opening uh, accelerated significantly, like on the order of the 1st of March. So, um, Mike, are you talking about marine areas? Marine areas six and seven. Oh, six and seven, so. Um, and, you know, as long as I'm, uh, people are saying, you know, the, the certain days here, certain days there, um, what we would like to see is just that the season opens um, and it's open. Um, and we have catch records. We can only catch one fish a day. Uh, we have to record our catch. That's enforceable. Uh, we would like to see the season be open. And then that way people uh, can fish. They can make plans to fish or they can fish on days when it's safe weather-wise. We have no blackmouth fishing up here. Um, and so this gives people an opportunity to go out and fish earlier in the year when there's more fish around, uh, success rate would be higher. People can fish uh, when it's safe to do so as opposed to a few days here and there when it's open. So um, thanks, Mike, I appreciate it. Are you talking about so we don't use the catch record card data for our quota management. We don't have that uh, and we don't have the ability to do it. You know, we don't have the ability to tally the catch record card data in season and know our catch relative to the quota. Um, Cause I know, I mean, that's a really popular concept for people to bring up is, you know, they, they want a halibut tag or that kind of thing. And, and we just don't have the resources to, to manage halibut that way. So in terms of, you know, this idea that you would open it for three months and people could just fish whenever um, it, you know, works for their schedule or the weather is, is something we've talked about for a long time. We talked about it, especially during those years I mentioned when we were exceeding the quota, um, oftentimes by, by double in the Puget Sound. Um, so the, that's where the four fish annual bag limit came into play and, the, and overlapping season dates as much as possible. Um, you know, um, so I just wanted to be clear about that. And, and I hear you on the March one, the interest in that. Um, I don't know, I, I think, you and I exchanged a few emails this this spring and appreciated that you brought that up. And I hadn't heard that idea for much, much earlier opening really from, from others. So it was um, good to hear some different feedback. And I, I don't know if others wanna um, comment on that idea. Yeah, the, uh, the, the mention of the catch record, I know, uh, one of the arguments of having a lot of open days would be, well, it's difficult to enforce uh, and concern about poaching and whatever, but uh, not, not necessarily that you would use that card for monitoring the progress of the catch, but it definitely incentivizes people to properly record their catch when they make it. So it's a disincentive for you know, poaching, if you will, or taking fish that they're not properly recording. As far as um, managing the quota, I mean, you guys, you have a model now, um, you have checkers, you won't have any blackmouth fishing going on up here, and you've been monitoring blackmouth fishing previous years when it's going on. So 
it would seem to us that a sample sampling approach that you already use in halibut fishing uh, would be sufficient. And as far as the quota goes, you know, when when the quota is reached for area six and area seven, it's shut down. Um, you guys do that a lot anyway. People get the press releases, they know. Yeah. Okay, I've got a couple hands up here. I just, um, Michael, I saw your hand go up first, but I think uh, if we could maybe um, get, hear from Glenn and Ann, I'm just thinking they might be more focused on this Puget Sound question. Um, Hi, Heather. This is Glenn. Hi, Glenn. You know, we, we can see by the Puget Sound uh, data that we aren't even going to come close to reaching our quota this year, and nor have we in the last five years now, I believe. Um, we, we, went in, we went to an approach and we added days in the inner Puget Sound by letting them open up in April, three days a week, and they kept going through three days a week until the uh, Labor Day, mm -hmm. and they're still continue three days a week uh, throughout the summer. Um, I would like to see the entire Puget Sound to include Marine Area 5 to add some more days during the same time step that we established this year, um, whether it be four days a week, whether it be four consecutive days a week or whether it be a Friday, Saturday and a Tuesday, Wednesday, just to add more time on the water during the season that's uh, that we, you know, the state reeled everybody back into one general season, you know, five, six years ago. And we've continued to expand little by little. Uh, mm -hmm. Last year, we was able to add those days in the inner Puget Sound. I would like to see some of those same opportunities to be afforded in Marine Area 5 and also add additional days throughout the Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so I guess relative to adding more days, uh, what are your thoughts on opening the season in March? So, and, and you know, a lot of times the reason we're, we're doing things stepwise is we don't know what to expect because it's been many, many years since we had the fishery open in April. So, you know, well, we started in mid April as a way to see it. And we really didn't, this year was a little bit better, but we haven't, you know, and, we've still and, and, been impacted by area. And you got it, you, you, perfect example. Um, we established this baseline. We mm -hmm. have a good idea over the last few years of what we're catching on a Thursday, or excuse me, a Thursday, Saturday schedule a Thursday, Friday, Saturday schedule, you know, you have that information already um, by adding one more date during the same time step being the middle of April through the end of June. Yeah. You can take those same numbers and correlate those with average catch. And yeah. by, but if you go earlier, like um, what might be a possibility, that's adding uh, an unknown variable into an already established baseline. Yeah, it, it would be harder to know what what we might see with the fishery opening in in March. Exactly. Um, yeah, so just just might thinking there might be think about trade offs between opening earlier or adding more days during the season to to get at that quota earlier than later. But, maybe not having a huge ability to do both. Right. So, okay, Anne, I'm gonna go to you next and then Brandon. There you go. Okay. Yeah, hi, um, I'm the um, sampling unit manager for those that might not know me. Um, so just a couple of, of things. So, um, the, I would I think I can say accurately that the majority of the staff that that do monitor the halibut fishery are um, either career se actually at this point mostly career seasonal staff and so for example in marine area seven they will return in 2022 on April 8th and that was based on the the 2021 season 
they they start about a week before the season starts. And then in Marine Area 6 this year, they started on the 15th because the season started a week later on April 22nd. So uh, I just kind of bring this up because I'm also in the process of uh, lotting all of our budgets for the next two years. But um, so at this point, um, we essentially, we, we, uh, we have staff on in that April, May, June timeframe, primarily for the halibut season. So at this point, uh, there's a significantly reduced number of staff on in, in March. Um, and again, for those of you, you know, most of you are familiar with the reduction in the blackmouth fisheries the last few years in particular. Um, but also something else that comes into play is that we use different sampling methods for the different marine areas. So at this point, um, marine areas five and six are more intensively monitored uh, with, with a couple of different methods. Um, and so, uh, but, but in, in marine areas seven through 10, where there's less effort and less catch, we use a baseline sampling method that where, where less staff are needed. So um, it's not a, like a straightforward across the board, you know, everything is done the same way everywhere at the same time. Mm -hmm. so, um, any changes to the date, the start date for halibut um, is something that, you know, pretty much I'm planning for right now and would need to um, account for, I guess, monetarily and also staffing wise. So that's just um, kind of the end of things that I, I work on. So I just wanted to just mention that, that, that currently um, it would take some work to get to have staff available to start much earlier than we already do. Um, it, we have moved the date up in, into April the last few years. So anyway, that's my, yeah. my two cents there. Yeah, really appreciate that, Anne. And, and the, the, the sampling difference is interesting. And it's something we, we don't talk a lot about because we haven't seen a lot of our halibut catch come from marine areas seven through 10. And what Anne's saying when she says it's, baseline sampling, it is it is a different method. So marine areas five and six, they do an intensive sampling. We ramped it up during those years when we were exceeding the quota. We get a weekly estimate for those areas based on those interviews. And in marine areas seven through 10, we actually get those post season through um, the phone interview, and so we add marine area seven through 10 catch on at the end. And, and so in marine area seven, relative to the idea that we could close upon quota attainment, we, we don't have that ability. We, we do in five and six, but we actually don't in marine areas seven through 10. Um, so I think that's an important point to think about. Um, when thinking about um, something that would potentially significantly change uh, what we know about Marine Area 7 and, and catch there. And I'm, I'm not saying we shouldn't make changes. I'm just saying we need to think about those and, and what that might mean. Um, I'll go to um, Brandon next. Did you take your hand down, Brandon? Okay, let's go to... Um, Do I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't know if I had to leave my hand up to talk or not. No. Nope. Okay, <laughs> but yeah, I, I like Glenn's approach. You know, if, if Nia Bay opens back up, um, they'll probably go back to, you know, maybe five, six, seven days, and then halibut fishing will be closed out there, um, with adding either one more day and splitting it up and having a couple, couple during the, the work week and a couple on the weekends would give everybody the opportunity working, retired, not working, uh, some fishing opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's a, a great idea. Um, one thing too, that everybody 
needs to know is like uh, Marine Area 5 through 10, we all share the, the pounds together. So um, it's to be fair for everybody, we all got to kind of open the same time, close the same time. So nobody feels like they're getting the short end of the stick, I, I feel. Um, but yeah, I mean, for us, the water conditions and stuff, everything, and have more days on the water and fishing opportunities. I'd like it to stay May, June. If not, then we're going to have dead dead spots throughout the year. And it just these small fishing villages would be gone. So uh, early May is pushing it for us, but it works. It's just a little um, scary at times when we get some Easterlies and stuff in here when we have all the docks put out. But uh, yeah, May, May through June would be would be good for for us and CQ for sure. And and yeah, either break it up. I don't know about four consecutive days. We did that uh, a few years ago, and that's when we got into trouble. But if we had a couple days in the in, during the week, and then had like a day a day off, a break or or two, and then had two more days on on the weekend, um, I think that would get us closer to the end number, and it sure would be safe. A Tuesday, Wednesday and a Friday, Saturday. It sounds pretty good to me too. So that's my two cents. Thank you. So the only thing about, you know, especially Marine Area 5, and if I learned anything from the pandemic is that you can't expect anything. I have no idea what to expect with Nia Bay opening. Sure. And, you know, making sure those dates are aligned with the North Coast has really been important. Um, so, and I, I just wanted to say that relative to the idea of, you know, the, your Friday, Saturday suggestion of, you know, if you have Nia Bay open Thursday, um, I should say Marine Area 4 open Thursday, but the Port of Nia Bay is not open. There's nowhere for anybody to land those fish if CQ is not open. So we want to think about that too. So the more, yeah, it just, the more we depart from this alignment of seasons, you know, I think it, it, it creates uncertainty and um, so going back to those principles and keeping those like ring area one and two aligned as much as possible and, and um, CQ and, and Nia Bay align as much as possible is something we want to keep thinking about. I think it's, it's been, been beneficial to everyone, but especially with the port of Nia Bay being closed. I know that's, that's complicated things a lot. Um, so let's see, I should um, maybe before, um, do you wanna to respond to that, Brendan? Sure. Okay. You just muted yourself, I think, or I did, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yep, I agree with you on uh, staying on schedule with Nia Bay. Um, it's a lot of up in the air stuff because yeah, if they open, then yeah, they wouldn't. It won't be too many days on the water, and they'll probably have it have their quota caught. But if if they next year don't open, I get that too. So um, yeah, a lot of unknowns. 
it's it's really quite crazy to think about um, those years where Nia Bay and La Push were open for four or five days, and the fact that um, it's so slow, but it's it's understandable without access there. Not every boat can leave from CQ and fish out there. It's I mean it's understandable, but it is quite different than than what we were dealing with a few years ago. So um, let's see. I've got a. I just want to pause for a second. Um, Michael Sawin, are you okay if we kind of keep the focus on Puget Sound, or do you want to do you want to chime in on the Puget Sound discussion? Are you okay if we just um, kind of keep circling back on that before we move move on to Westport? Uh, um, it's really up to you, Heather. I don't have anything to say about Puget Sound, but uh, if you want to keep the focus on Puget Sound, then that's fine for now. Okay, keep your hand up and we'll get there. <laughs> okay. okay, I think, um, uh, Dave, you've had your hand up for a while, so go ahead. Can okay. you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Brandon and Glenn and all that. The one thing I wanted to bring up is I am uh, pretty strongly, um, I don't know how to say it, but in agreement if we keep the catch sharing plan exactly the way we have it now until the North Coast ports open up, I don't think it's fair to the North Coast ports to change the catch sharing plan um, because more effort's been shifted to other ports during this pandemic. And I think we should wait until we do anything um, until we have a year or two back to normal if we ever get there before we change any catch sharing plans. Um, I just don't think it's fair to try to do something when we've had a pandemic with effort shift in all kinds of different ports at this time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Dave. I mean, um, are you, I guess I wanna just follow up on that a little bit, but you, would you, I mean, because what I'm hearing from Glenn and Brandon is some interest in, in just adding more days of the week, not necessarily any earlier, but just more days of the week. And I think getting at the idea that Mike Henderson brought, brought forward of more opportunity earlier, I know it's not getting at the way earlier, the March idea, but... Um, so are, is, is that where you're in support? Yeah, I'm in support of that. Um, you know, Ron and I have been trying to get it earlier in April in this Puget Sound. Uh -huh. um, but we know the fish checker thing. And, you know, I would love to see it open April 1st. But the problem we have and the four fish annual limit changes that a little bit because when Nia Bay and the push were open Thursday, Saturday, and area five was open on Friday, a lot of effort shifted from Nia Bay down to there and we sucked up their quota pretty fast because we didn't have the four fish annual limit. Right. That's changed a little bit now, but I just, I think with the pandemic um, shifting quota, say from the North coast to the South coast, I think I'd like to hold off on trying to do anything like that until we get another year or two of normalcy and see what happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we can talk about this a little bit more, but I think the idea that of what we've been doing when, when I went through the catch by sub area and we've talked about this for the last couple of years, the good thing that NIMS has allowed us to do is be flexible with that. And, um, 
you know, we've been able to open Westport for another all depth day in the Columbia River, even though they've taken their sub area quota and it's because of, you know, good discussions we have during the season and, um, you know, folks getting the opportunity to get through June and see where we are. So I, I do have interest in including in the cat sharing plan um, some language that is more um, to the point about that flexibility. So it's written in there. So we don't have to uh, be concerned that NIMPS is having to do some in-season rulemaking. It's better if we have that built in um, at the get-go. So that, um, and, and I do like the way we've handled the sharing of the sport allocation by sub area in these very weird times where nothing seems to be normal and it's hard to predict what's going to happen. Um, that flexibility has just been so critical. So that is a change um, that from, from my point of view, I think um, I would like to see put in the cat sharing plan and, and NIMPS would support it as well. And would help us uh, make sure that language is, is um, kind of what we need to be to, to make it less difficult for not just us, but also for um, NIMPS rulemaking for in-season if we're more explicit about how to do that. Yeah, I'm all in support of that because you had to go through heck four weeks ago to do all this um, well, for area one and two. I think I saw Catherine on here. They did all the heavy lifting, <laughs> but, but, but you're, uh, uh, no, it's all good. And yeah, we've all worked so good together. And I pray to God that the South Coast also gets a day in September. And I think they will, um, you know, so we can try to catch this quota. Yeah. So okay. Thank you for thank everything. Dave. Yeah. Thanks, Dave. So let's see. Um, I've got uh, Glenn and Mike hands up. I, I sorry, I don't know who raised their hand first. Heather, it goes in order. So Michael, uh, I have unmuted. Oh, oh. Microphone. you can talk now. Okay. Uh, you got me, Heather? Yeah. Uh, well, I just, I had a few things. Um, one, uh, I, my first few key points about areas one through four is that uh, the quota and the allocation percentages that uh, were, that were divided up haven't been addressed since you know, the 90s, late 90s or something. And I think that the halibut fishing has changed a lot over the years between where boats fish, the large charter boats versus the little boats and that type of stuff. And, uh, you know, we definitely recognize that COVID has impacted where people fish and you know, with Neo Bay being closed and all that stuff, it kind of it shifted a lot of the percentages around. And I think you guys did a great job being on your toes and getting getting quota and letting us catch fish. Uh, but we, our thought was, uh, we'd like to propose that. Uh, we opened areas one through four the first part of May for two days a week for six weeks, assuming that there's quota available. Uh, each week, having one weekday, like in the past, it's been Thursday, and then having the areas choose their Saturday or Sunday or a weekend day for the two days. And then at the end of the six week period, uh, have the total catch calculated by WDFW and any remaining quota uh, would first be provided to the North Coast 
for up to two days of fishing in August. And then additional quota after that to be split up through all the four areas. And uh, the dates for both the two potential days for the North Coast and for up to three additional days uh, for the all area uh, to be determined preseason. And uh, that, that way it make the planning a little bit easier for, you know, when we're going to have trips and not having to scramble around throughout the, while we're out here fishing. Uh, but, you know, we really appreciate all the work that you've done. And I know others have done the past couple of years, just swinging around and getting everything settled down for us so that we can go fishing. Um, we have, we have, we didn't include the Puget Sound in our proposal uh, because it hasn't, I don't think that it's impacted I knew it. the changes in the charter and private boat fleet. Yes. Uh, but hopefully moving forward, we can keep going in the right direction that we, that we have been. Uh, those, those are just my thoughts. Okay, Michael. Well, that's more than thoughts. That's like a, a full-on proposal. So I I I was writing it down. I I want to make sure I I might need you to fill in some blanks here toward the end. So open marine areas one through four in early May, two days a week for six weeks. And so that would be um, in the idea there is kind of um, managing that six week period under a combined allocation, so to say. And Correct. then yeah. it would be one day a week. So almost like the North Coast Thursday, Saturday and South Coast Sunday, Tuesday, as we have it now. At the end of six weeks, then we tally the catch. And any remaining quota would go to the North Coast for dates in August. Well, it, it would go to the North Coast uh, for, for two days. And then if, if there was still quota left after the two days in, there are two days in August, then uh, we would have the all area open back up in August or September. The remaining quota would go to the North Coast for two days in August. Correct. And then if there is quota after that, then we would switch, we would go back to the all area until the quota was used. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I think I'm, I think I'm following. Um, it's basically a coastwide, um, coastwide meaning marine areas one to four, co combining of the allocation, except that the North Coast might get a couple extra days. Correct. Okay. And I just assume that if the quota was caught before that before. was up, then um, all areas would just be closed. Oh, uh, yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah, okay.
Okay, Glenn, it looks like your hand up is next. Can you hear me, Heather? Yeah. So I wanted to circle back around with uh, what David said about um, the allocation. You know, we we're just still dealing with this pandemic, and Area Four has yet to fish for the last two years now, two seasons. Um, we don't know what kind of effect that's going to have. And that you know, kind of ties in with Puget Sound and our fishing season here in area four, five, because you want us to open and be closed on the same dates, which kind of hamstrings area five, um, which, you know, I don't necessarily agree with. I think we should be separated. Um, that's more of an enforcement issue than it is uh, anything else. Um, I believe the area five should be open at the same time as the rest of the Puget Sound should be open. And that sh uh, area four shouldn't really, we shouldn't base our season base, based on that because we don't know if it's going to be open or not. So we're going to cut the fishing season, cut days off the water because we don't know whether or not area four is going to be open for their allocation. So I, you know, I, I'd like to see that area five and area four separated uh, since we are Puget Sound. And, and at the same time, uh, the allocation shift, you know, I don't know if that's all that. You know, we, we are doing that internally now. We did it this year and we did it last year internally. And I don't know, um, I don't know if that's fair for area four to, you know, I, Tom would have to kind of ch uh, chime in on that. I don't know if that'd be fair for area four to lose time on the water or potentially losing time on the water. Um, if this pandemic doesn't slow down and they get, get to be open. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I definitely understand the point about being tied to Marine Area 4, but, um, and it is an enforcement issue, but it's not really one we can ignore if Mia Bay is closed. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think we can just, um, not think about it. I mean, I, I hear you, Glenn. I hear what you're saying. I just. I'm not saying ignore, ignore it. What I'm saying is that, you know, mm -hmm. we've been open and closed at different times for the last 15, 20 years. I mean, I'm not sure why it needs to change. Okay. Um, go ahead, Mike. Hi, um, yeah, I just wanted to give everybody a chance to respond to the Puget Sound comments that I made. And I just, uh, to follow up on so what I've heard, um, again, for us, uh, adding days in the May and June timeframe really doesn't do anything for us. As I stated before, when you analyze the catch, the Creel reports, the, the success rate drops off considerably after the 1st of May. So, you know, I, I said March 1st, we would take what we could get. It sounded like there was maybe some support for earlier in April, maybe as early as April 1st, um, we'll take what we can get, but we're looking for a way to catch our share of the quota. And that needs to be when the fish are in our area, not after they've moved out. I do know for a fact there are fish here in early March. I've seen uh, bins in the back of pickup trucks being filled uh, with tribal longliners um, right off the mouth of Deception Pass in early March. So the earlier we can get it in our area, the more meaningful it would be for us, as, again, especially since we have no blackmouth opportunity. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mike. 
Your turn, Tom. Thank you, Heather. I, I would like to address a couple of different issues. First of all, on the Area 5 uh, May fisheries, this year th in May, if I remember correctly, and you, it may be different that Area 5 uh, didn't get a third day. They had to align with Area 4, and it was an enforcement issue uh, that uh, Captain Chadwick uh, was concerned about. I would sure like to see us revisit that enforcement issue and uh, talk to Captain Chadwick to see if it's possible to get Area 5 a little more time in May. I mm -hmm. think that would be uh, appropriate. Let's mm -hmm. see if we could work around this enforcement issue, and see what we could do to, to help with that. So that's what I have to say about Area 5. The um, other thing I want to talk about is Michael's uh, proposal. I'm in the same camp, not surprisingly, that, that Dave is. Uh, we haven't had a meaningful fishery in Nia Bay in the last two years uh, because we haven't been able to fish in our port. And it wasn't so many years ago before the 1.5 million pounds um, that we had a three day season in Nia Bay, three days. And we had like 13 or 14,000 pounds left on our quota, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And I called the Westport representative to ask for help that year. And his response to me was, don't make your problem my problem. And it seems like we on the North Coast, at least I think we have been pretty receptible to uh, moving in this in this time of moving pounds of, of tr trying to make it work for everybody we want to catch the fish we want everybody to catch the fish but give us a chance to fish in our port let's find you know let's see if we can keep this 1.5 million pounds before we go making any allocation changes or doing a coastwide allocation I'm just I just don't think that that is fair to the the North Coast. Halibut on the North Coast is our tuna. We don't have our tuna fishery like, like they do in Westport. We all know we're all suffering the salmon woes. Um, we need that this quota up here uh, and we want an opportunity to fish it. If we get an opportunity to fish it and we can't catch it, we have always been receptible to spreading it out and that won't change. And so I, I just am not in favor of that uh, proposal. I respect Michael and I, I, I understand, I get it, I get it, but it's just the wrong time. And uh, I, I just don't, don't support it. So that's my thoughts, thank you. Thanks, Tom. Mike Henderson, your hand is still up. I just want to make sure that it's just uh, from your last comment before I, okay. Um, that's your, your next, Butch. Hey, Heather. Um, so uh, back to the, back to Michael's uh, proposal. Um, I, I really don't disagree with anything Tom has said. Um, and, and he's been more than fair when, when we need fish. Um, I, I do, I do understand that this is a proposal to be modeled and not, uh, this is not a cast in concrete way. If I understand this right, this is, you know, you have status quo, you have, you know, uh, B and, and A, B and C, or I don't know if you have three proposals, but I, I do understand that the, the only, the only thing, and, and I even stand to lose a day or two over Michael's proposal, but, um, 
you know, it, 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 is it fair to 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 uh, bring it out now while Tom has been shut down for a couple of years? That's that's a good question. Um, that that's a valid that is a valid question. Um, and 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 I don't think that the. I mean, I haven't even talked to Michael about this proposal, so I. I, I but but I, I don't think um, the Westport Char Association is trying to be unfair or or kick a person when when they're down. I also am apologize. Um, this is the night my wife goes and tries to once a once every two weeks to get supplies over at Costco. Um, I, I release her from her from her chain. Um, I hate watching this motel and office. I, I just, I, I, I hate it. So, so there was about 10 things going on at once. And, and, and I just wondered what was this, was this proposal um, tied to the 1.2 million? So if it slipped under that, it would go, you know, back to a, a more normal division. I, I didn't hear that, um, but I was, I was, had, you know, 15 other things going at once. Um, and, and, and if it was, that might be a way to look at it in the future. Um, those are questions I have. I, I'm not, I'm not, um, you know, we, we, at this point in time, as you pointed out in your timeline, your time step, I mean, we can look at anything. We, we could look at, uh, you know, area five and, and two, given all their fish to tell Waco, if we wanted to, I, I'm not proposing that, but we, we could, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go anywhere. Um, and, and so, I mean, it, it just, uh, I just wanted to make sure I heard the proposal, right. I, 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 like I said, I completely understand the proposal, but I completely understand, uh, the rationale why, about Nia Bay not being open for a couple of years, and and uh, and I and I am sympathetic to, to that. That that is for sure. And Tom, um, God bless his soul, is always is. It's never been hell no to me when I've called Tom for something, and I and I want to point that out. And 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 out of respect for Tom and 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 the great working relationship I feel we have um, with the North Coast. So I don't know what happened when Tom was told to get get the hell out of here <laughs> but I, I i don't know that story but but i'm sure it, it happened or or something like that and, and that's unfortunate but i don't think the people we have now um would do that um necessarily like that again so 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 anyway that that's my questions i guess and statement on on uh, the proposal i don't think necessarily may, may, maybe it should be at least analyzed and and in october we can either say that's the best idea we ever uh, heard of, or we can just say, God, Mike, you're a rookie. Why in the heck did you bring that up? Jesus, you know, what were you thinking? So, I mean, we, those are the options too. So that, that's, um, that, that's, that's my questions and, and my thoughts on that. So th thank, thank you. Thanks, Butch. So I'll, I didn't hear any linkage to the um, 2 a tack, but uh Michael's up next and I'll let him speak to that. But I did want to just confirm, Butch, that you're right. What we're doing here is putting out ideas for public review and um, it, nothing's yeah, carved in stone. It's a range of alternatives and that includes status quo. So, and then I'll, I'll be the one doing the analysis to say, you know, based on recent catch, if you did six weeks um, per the proposal by uh, the South Coast or Westport, you could expect to get what you, you know, X, Y, Z. And, and I don't know, maybe you guys have already done the math, um, Michael, but um, anyway, that's that's exactly right. And we've come back in October and, and look at that. And, and same for um, Mike Henderson's idea, with the exception of we don't have any data for um, what would happen if we opened marine areas six through 10. Um, well, the only data we have for opening areas six through 10 really are um, what happened this year? 
So we know what happens from April 22nd on, um, but we have heard exactly what you're saying, uh, Mike, about the higher catch rates. And it's why we had to avoid it for many years. People wanted to do it. But again, that's back to the years when we were going over our Puget Sound quota quite frequently before we implemented that intensive sampling program that Ann mentioned early on. So um, I don't have as much data to analyze earlier season opening dates for Puget Sound. Um, so anyway, uh, it looks like um, Randy, you're you're next. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I'd like to echo what Tom <clears throat> said, and um, and I'm hoping that with uh, Area Three being open now, that it's going to set a precedence. Uh, to Nia Bay, and we can um, get back to some normalcy. Yeah. I hope so, too. Um, okay, put your hands up. Thanks, Randy. Well, um, I, well, the only hand up is Randy, and I think that's just because he hasn't taken it down yet. <laughs> so this has been um, a really good discussion. I feel like I um, have some good input on what folks want to see in terms of a range of alternatives or what to bring forward. Um, for the September council meeting and what I'll be looking at after the September council meeting and leading up until November in terms of what we might see for these impacts. And I'll just say, um, I heard support for, for what we did in 2021. Um, so status quo, some interest in, um, continuing to align the LINCOD retention allowance in Marine Area 1 with Oregon, if we can move that um, ball a little farther down the road. Um, and then heard some input on more, well, earlier, more opportunity in the Puget Sound, I just want to say in general. And that's completely understandable considering, you know, at in August, you have about 40,000 pounds of quota left to be taken. So more opportunity in terms of an earlier start date in green areas six through 10. Um, and um, adding more days of the week was of interest as another alternative to earlier or, you know, if there's an opportunity to add some weekdays on to um, the structure we have for Thursdays and Saturdays or Thursday, Friday, Saturdays, some interest in um, just maybe even for Marine Area 5 doing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, not just in June, but also in May. Um, and let's see. Um, acknowledgement that you know, Nia Bay is still operating under less than ideal situation and that significant changes should wait until we have a more normal situation for Nia Bay and things back in order. Um, and then the, the proposal for, or from Westport for looking at um, that six weeks kind of everybody all together and see how far things go and then looking at things after that. Um, and I think 
And then just the idea that, you know, this is range of alternatives and um, it's okay to not mark anything off the um, alternatives that we put out for public review for now and that we can um, process them. I can analyze them. We can come back and refine them when we get together in October. Am I missing anything? Go ahead, Dave. Thanks. I'd also like to do my annual thing and try to get this limit raised to six fish annually. Okay. Okay. Um, Thanks. You know what, Dave? Yes, I, I looked at that. This annual limit is not in the catch sharing plan. So all I'm saying is we don't have to make a change to the catch sharing plan to do that. I, I, okay. I've been hearing you say that. So I actually, I think Oregon did the same thing and um, didn't include the annual limit in the catch sharing plan, but anyway, got it. Thank you, cheers. <laughs> cheers. Okay, anything else I'm missing here? Well, um, we got just a couple minutes. Um, I really appreciate the good discussion we had. Um, oh, is there anything in the chat? Oh, hi, Dave. I, Dave Krimquist, I didn't know you were on here. Are you, maybe Dave is the one we can't hear. Well, thanks for the update on the Puget Sound catch. Anyway, I'll let everybody go and have um, your, your evening to yourself. Uh, thank you for the really good input and the good discussion. I'll follow up with the email group. I have my email halibut mailing list um, when I've got the WDFW report that condenses all this information into our, our proposed changes. Um, which I'll check in with Maggie and, and see ahead of that, you know, what they're thinking in terms of link hog retention. And, um, and if folks have any questions about how, or uh, how to listen to the um, council's discussion on halibut, I, maybe what I wanna do is go back to the agenda here real quick and, Pass. Oops. Um, can you see the agenda? I'm going to assume you can. <laughs> so here's the next steps. Um, and I just wanted to point out here um, that the halibut agenda item is scheduled on the September um, council meeting for the first thing on Monday, September 13th. So you can tune in at eight o'clock and uh, listen to the council's discussion on this um, and listen to the advisory body reports on this. Um, there if you want and that's the good thing about it being first thing in in the morning is uh you can track its progress a little bit more council meetings have um then this virtual world uh we've had some long days and stuff so if the agenda item from i guess it would be saturday the 11th we're not going to meet on sunday the 12th we are meeting on Saturday the 11th. So if anything from Saturday goes really long, it could bump halibut a little bit later, but um, we, we can hope that that's 
that's going to be the first thing on Monday, September 13th. And I just wanted to say if anybody has any questions about um, the council process or joining on that webinar, just let me know. I'd be happy to help you. Um, and that's it. Um, check in the chat. Okay, thanks, Anne. Okay, thanks, Dave. Well, thanks for putting your input in the chat, Dave. <laughs> anyway, thanks, everybody. Have a really good evening. And feel free to call me or email me if you have any follow-up questions.